KIG Ministry presents the Catholic Influencers Podcast. Join me, Alyssa Aegis, and my co-hosts, Father Rob Gallia and Justine Cumbo, as we break open the upcoming Sunday Gospels and discuss relevant topics and life issues from a Catholic perspective. For a shorter, more reflective explanation of the Gospels, be sure to check out our sister podcast, Catholic Influencers, Father Rob Gallia Homilies. Welcome to another episode of the Catholic Influencers Podcast. It is a special bonus episode today where we have a very special guest with us and that is Father Dr. Father, Father Dr. Um, Chris, Chris Ryan, who is MGL as well. How are you doing, Father Chris? I'm doing really well, Father Rob. It's great to be on your podcast. Thanks for having me. I just want to introduce Father Chris for those of you who, who don't know who he is. Father Chris is the parish priest of, now I hope I get the, this right, Penhurst and Peakhurst parishes. How does that work? How are you a parish priest of two parishes? So the parishes are twinned and so I'm the parish priest of both, but one of my MGL brothers has much of the responsibility day to day for one of the parishes and then I have uh, the responsibility for the other one, uh, but ultimate responsibility for both rests with me. Oh, that's awesome. And you have a heart, uh, like a passion for evangelization. I mean, the, even part the fact that you're part of the uh, MGL, min, min, Missionaries of God's Love. I love the MGLs. I just, I, I always said, if I had the courage to take um, a vow of the vows that you take, I, I would be an MGL. I, I, I don't, I, it's a vocation within a vocation, isn't it? So, uh, and it's, yeah. uh, what's, what's your charisma as, a, as a, an order, sort of? So the pillars of the MGLs are prayer, brotherhood, and evangelization. So we're very committed to being contemplative is in action, to really having a deep and rich prayer life. We also do that as a community, as a brotherhood. And so we really emphasize the fact that we're brothers together in mission, and that brotherhood is at the service of our evangelizing uh, heart, our passion for people to encounter the Lord Jesus through the gift of his Holy Spirit and become his disciples. And we're particularly interested in serving young people and the poor. That's beautiful. And I, I just see that so beautifully. And I, I do a lot of um, work with the MGLs, like the conferences and praise and worship nights and just a, a lot of beautiful occasions. And I always, I always go out feeling just so much on fire um, with love for Jesus. So just, yeah, thank you for your yes and for, for your ministry. But also you, I, I know you from youth ministry. Now I speak at a lot of youth events across Australia. But you were like the guy for youth ministry. Um, and, and in fact, actually, now you have a PhD in RCIA and youth ministry. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So I guess I've, I've always been involved in youth ministry, always been passionate about it um, long before I was ever ordained. And it came from the fact that, you know, that it was through a youth ministry that I'd had my own really deep encounter with the Lord and then wanted to, um, to share that with others, which really took me on the journey to priesthood. So I'd been involved in youth ministry long before I started studying to be a priest and then in my in my seminary days and then uh, as a as a priest. So probably the, the culminating point in that was that I was able to take the World Youth Day across around Australia in the lead up to the 2008 World Youth Day. So for those of you who haven't seen that, the World Youth Day cross is like the Olympic torch. <laughs> it was like Good the, way of watching. the prelude, you know, for the, the lead up uh, to the, the World Youth Day itself in Sydney. But my, my, a part of my passion, I guess, was that I really wanted to um, call youth ministry forward in this country to help um, youth ministers be able to do their very important role better. And so um, my study, my research as a, in, in my doctoral work is really about young people and how do we best engage them in faith? How do we best help them to encounter Jesus for themselves? And that took me to the RCIA as a wonderful model for thinking about how we evangelize young people today. So that's my, yeah, my doctoral work. That's beautiful. And it's so much needed because I think a lot of youth ministry, even RCIA is like spontaneous. We go how we feel, we go with a book, but there's, there's a, a, a not, not enough planning, not enough intention, I think, and not enough research, marketing research. Like I, I work in, in the, the ministry that I do with the online courses, education and but uh, people see the even the social media posts, but there's a lot of research that goes out with every single post. There's a lot of research. There's a lot of um, algorithms that we see that we look. Everything we do should be somewhat intentional. Now, not everyone has the resources to do that, but I think this is part of what your study is, is that like we shouldn't just shoot bullets 
without knowing where we're shooting. I know maybe not a good good analogy, but <laughs> I'm supposed to shine the, to the the spotlight and without knowing where we're going to shine it. And I think this is yeah, this is something I suppose that you, uh, would have come out a lot in in intention and direction and how we should focus our RCIA youth ministry. I think one of the great things, Rob, is that the church actually has given us some great ways to think about how we should evangelize uh, young people and not young people. And the RCIA is for unbaptized adults. Both of them, though, need thought and, they, and there is a, in, an intentionality and a pattern that we can follow that the church has given us. And part of what I wanted to do was to share the richness of that with people so that they actually do youth ministry, adult evangelization better. And so um, you're absolutely right. If we pay attention to some of those patterns, those key moments, we can actually help people perhaps better than we have been to be able to encounter the Lord and to really mature in that initial encounter so that they become real disciples and, and missionaries in turn themselves. Exactly. And I think it's about being led by the Spirit, but also it's sort of, it, what do they say? It's just, it's knowledge and that also builds on the grace, you know, it's that, that understanding. So it's working together with, with the Spirit, but also with the mind that God has given us. We, um, we might come back to this, but the, the centre that I run called the Arete Centre, our motto is Remis et Velis, which is a lat Latin for with oars and sails. And ah, so for us, go. the sails is the image of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that's got to inspire all that we're doing. It's the Holy Spirit who leads us. It's the Holy Spirit who evangelises. He's the principal evangeliser not us, but yes. also with oars, because um, when we also have a, a part to play in the mystery of God's providence, we get to help row, uh, as it were. And so when you get oars and sails going together, the ship really moves. Yes. So we, we want to be able to make sure that we're thinking about the wind and breath and inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but we also want to think about how we can... Um, in a sense, the image, the other image I love to use is we just lay the we lay the fire. We can't light the fire. That's the Holy Spirit's mm. work. But we can lay the wood, and we can lay the wood well, so that when the spark comes, the wood really catches fire. That's so right. That's, that's what we're trying to do. Yes, and that's what. Yeah, I think it's a, not a, basing ourselves on on sort of good luck. You sort of the, the, in the business sense that they say good luck is is basically prepar when preparation meets opportunity. And so this is what it is. It's uh, you prepare, and then the, the Holy Spirit provides the opportunity, and then you you go, you move forward. And so this is what you do, also, Father Chris. Is you run an evangelization um, center, and we'll talk about this a little bit la later. But running two parishes, um, PhD, um, youth ministry advisor, and 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 also now doing this. Um, evangelization center and i we would really love to hear about this and uh, throughout this podcast we're going to hear about ways in which we can evangelize so let's go today um today's scripture today is the 22nd this week it's going to be the 22nd sunday in ordinary time and this is taken from mark chapter 7 now this is a complicated verses 1 to 8 14 to 15 21 to 23 why, why does the sometimes why do we skip verses <laughs> i think they i think they were trying to make it easier for us but it doesn't always work that way does it yeah that's right when especially when you're reading from a and so to speak an an analog vibe an analog <laughs> bible it's just like you have to find verses and then then skip but for because this is so complicated i'm going to be using um universalis um to to read the scripture so this is a, the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 7. The Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus, and they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with unclean hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and the Jews in general followed the tradition of the elders and never eat without washing their arms as far as their elbow. And on returning from the market, they never eat without first sprinkling themselves. There are also many other observances which have been handed down to them concerning the washing of cups and pots and bronze dishes. So these Pharisees and the scribes asked them, Why do your disciples not respect the traditions of the elders, but eat their food with unclean hands? He answered, It was you hypocrites that Isaiah so rightly prophesied in the passage of Scripture. These people honor me with their lip service while their hearts are far from me. The worship they offer to me is worthless. 
the doctrines they teach are only human regulations. You put aside the commandments of God to cling to human traditions. He called the people to himself again and said, Listen to me, all of you, and understand nothing that goes into a man from outside can make him unclean. It is the things that come out of, of them that makes them unclean. For it is from within that a man's heart that evil intentions emerge. Fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, malice, deceit, indecency, envy, slander, pride, folly. All these evil things come from within and make a man unclean. How easy is this gospel to explain? <laughs> yeah, I'm really glad you, you um, picked this weekend uh, this Sunday for, uh, for me to come on board. <laughs> it's, a, it's a tough one. It is. It but is. I, Well, I guess, I guess one of the ways that I always like to think about Scripture is that we, talk, we might talk about once upon a time, which is what did the scripture mean? What was Jesus saying back then, 2,000 years ago? And then the other way of reading the Bible is to say, this is your life. And so it's also about how does it speak to us today? And so hopefully in this conversation, we can interweave those two things in what we're talking about. I guess the, the place that I wanted to pick up was um, that the focus here is on these unwashed hands uh, that the disciples have, and the Pharisees are shocked by this because at the time there were – uh, ritual purity laws that the, was required that for the people had to wash their hands before they could eat, and it was less about hygiene than it was about actually about um, making sure that they were pure before God. Mm -hmm. And Jesus' disciples weren't doing it. Maybe it was because in the just in the previous story they'd been eating all that bread, and they were in a lonely place. There was the miracle of the loaves that no one had time to wash their hands properly. So the Pharisees are shocked by that. One of the things that I, I think is important to notice here too, Rob, is that the Pharisees had taken some laws that we see in the book of Exodus and in the book of Numbers back in the Old Testament, uh, many years before the time of Jesus. These were laws for the priests to wash their mm. hands, to be ritually pure before they offered sacrifice uh, to God. Which, which, is what we, temple. which is what we do still at Mass. Absolutely. But what the Pharisees had done is they then said, no, this is not just for the priests, this is for everybody. Mm. Everybody's got to be uh, pure in that way. And Jesus' disciples aren't doing it. And so I think what Jesus is doing here is he's challenging their whole practice. He's saying, hang on a minute, rather than sort of take issue with their objection, he's saying, no, be careful that because your outward behavior isn't matching up to what's going on inside of your heart, and that's what's required here. Yes. Is that what you're thinking? Yeah, look, I, I think it's a, this is the, the battle that Jesus constantly had with the, the frustration, I imagine. He would have been so frustrated, like that these guys are doing the right thing, sort of they have the right intention, but they've lost the heart of why we do these things. Why? Why do we wash our hands? Why, wh wh why do, did the Jews do all of this? But mostly, if, you, if he went around with a microphone, Jesus went around with a microphone and says, hey, why are you washing your hands? Most people wouldn't even know why they're doing it. They probably did it simply out of fear, because if they didn't, they're not a good Jew. And that brought to the point that they thought that this ritual would actually make them a good Jew that the ritual would actually make them right before God. But the, the practice in itself is only an instrument to reining the heart. When I say reining, it's like on a horse, you know, you put the, the stirrups, the rein, and you're guiding the horse. Um, and this is what we do. And this is, this is, we just released a course on the Mass. And this was my frustration also. Why so many people do go to Mass, they do their Catholic aerobics, stand, sit, kneel, they, they do so much, but they don't actually know why. But every action, every ritual, every symbol in the Holy Mass, even in our practice, has a purpose to draw our hearts to what is actually happening in the Mass. Now, it's not only the Mass, you know, even in relationships, hey, we just do the things that we we used to do, and, and, and then it just becomes empty, it becomes stale bread. Something that was fresh, that was good once, but eventually becomes stale. I think when I'll jump off something you were saying there, because one of the things that I think is really important to remember about the Pharisees is that these guys were like a renewal group within Judaism. So these are, like we think of the Pharisees these days, and they're the baddies who are pitted against Jesus. 
But we've got to remember that these are really devout, committed, they're, they're hungry for God, as it were. Mm. Um, so I, I sometimes say to people, just let's, before we sort of say, oh, the Pharisees, bad guys out there, and we kind of find ourselves looking for the Pharisees uh, in our world, maybe, oh, that person or this, there's a little Pharisee running around inside of all of us. Mm. There's, a, there's, a, there's a, a real invitation and challenge here in this passage to say, hang on a minute, how am I maybe just focusing on the externals and, and maybe where it started with the heart, it's become external observance, where maybe, you know, for the Pharisees, I imagine, it originally came from this place of wanting to do the right thing before God, but they slowly twist it and they think that it's their external observance that's going to make it them right before God rather than it's something that God does in them and, and through them. Yes, and because external observances are comfortable, it's easy, like it's almost guaranteed, you know, it's like you know you can see it, you can touch it, you can sort of feel satisfied by doing it and, and, and you know your work is done, but things of the heart, there's like almost no resolution, there's no guarantee. And it, it, I think things of the heart, and this is where Jesus kept on emphasizing is, hey, you're going to have to become vulnerable. You're going to have to uh, allow God to, to work and, and even in the uncertainty of things to trust God. Because if we trust rituals and there's a formula, which uh, don't, don't get me wrong, I, I think formula is good. Like we do novenas, we do rosaries, we, we go to mass, we do our actions there as well. But them themselves, we can go into a rosary and walk out the exact same way we walked in. We can go into a mass and walk out the same way. We can go to a novena, expect things from God, but our lives are not changed. And so these actions are good, but only in as much as they draw us to the heart of God, to relationship with God. And I can, again, this is what Jesus was just so, he would have been so frustrated. Not that the law was bad. And as you said, he didn't obey it, maybe because they were busy and because there was too much going on. And at the end of the day, it wasn't worth the cost of not feeding the people. But the, they lost the point, sort of the ritual was more important than the actual feeding of the people. And this is where we go wrong. Hey, this is sometimes, I don't know if you ever like you, um, uh, working in a parish, I suppose you get this, you know, you, you're in the middle of your prayer and someone knocks at the door and needs something and you're thinking, hold on, I'm praying, I need to spend time with Jesus, then I will see to you. But this is, I think, one of the things even in our ritual to, to come up and say, Jesus, let's walk to this person together. Let's, let's have a conversation. Let's, let me meet you in prayer in the life of this person. And yeah, where the law is not king, but Jesus is king of our lives. Yeah, absolutely. And I think also there's that, you know, as Catholics, the practices of faith really matter. Like, and, you know, when I'm encouraging people to grow in their faith, I'm saying to them, look, you need to spend time in prayer each day. And mm. Mass is at the very source and heart of our lives as Catholic Christians. And there are beautiful prayers that we can pray, disciplines that we can have, like, you know, morning and evening, the examine of St. Ignatius. There's wonderful practices that we have. Mm. And one of the things that practices do is we and we sometimes think it's all from the inside out. It's all from our heart outwards. But our outside actions do actually shape and change our heart. The key thing that Jesus is saying here is these two things have to align. Yes. They've got to line up. And so, um, and I think that then probably segues or moves into the next piece where Jesus really does say something about being careful and making sure that we're not following human traditions. Yes. Yeah, the, the passage goes on to talk about this and says, look, um, you know, you, he warns them and says, look, you're, just, you're following these human traditions. And for some people, we can hear that as Jesus saying, you know, what, what, you know some, perhaps sometimes non-Catholic Christians can say, you know, what is it about the Catholic Church and traditions? Jesus explicitly in a passage just like this says, no, don't follow tradition. But what we need to realize here is that Jesus is saying, that there are man-made traditions. There are things that we can, in the name of religion, if you like, in the name of God, we can introduce. Just like the Pharisees extended that that um, prayer that was just for the priests to everybody, that ritual washing. Now it's for everyone. That's Jesus saying here, that's a man-made tradition. That wasn't what God originally intended. And so what Jesus is, is saying here is be careful of hum merely human traditions, but he's not anti-tradition. Exactly. Church. The church needs that, and the church has always understood that. We see in St. Paul, 
you know, in, in lots of different passages, Paul says, look, I want you to, I'm handing on to you what I first received. Mm -hmm. you know, on the night that before he died, Jesus took this bread in his hands. Paul's saying, look, I'm teaching you what was handed on to me by Jesus. Um, uh, I come in another passage. He says, "I commend you. Be, I commend you because you remember me and everything, and you maintain the traditions as I have delivered them to you." Mm. So, one of the things that's really important about this passage is it's not anti-tradition; it's anti the wrong kinds of traditions, yes. ones that we can't trace back to Jesus. But a tradition has to be. You know, sometimes a tradition can be like become like a dusty old book, if you like. Mm. It needs to be blown. You know, the the dust needs to be blown off it so that we can appropriate it from the heart. And Jesus will always keep bringing us back to what's your heart response to me? What's your heart response to God? And the tradition's there to serve that. It's not an enemy of it, but it, a good tradition, a tradition that comes from God that we've received through the church, is there to kind of there to blow off the dust so that we can encounter the Lord through it. Yes, and it's not only thousand-year-old traditions that, that can become dusty, even traditions that we, we bring about in our own lives that stop, that w once changed us, that once influenced us, but and then eventually we realize that we're doing the same things, including um, worshipping God, including preaching, including practicing um, our life of prayer, but we start to realize, hey, while at the same time, uh, the fruit of our life is not is not in line with that, and this is where the where the gospel ends, and it talks about all those sins that we we keep moving forward, we move forward in the traditions. But you know, I, well, there was a um, a few years ago, I was invited with a with a friend of mine to go to to um, California to um, to attend a service of this television evangelist. Now he was like filling up stadiums and I mean miracles after miracles it was just absolutely stunningly incredible and lives were being changed and this person like you just couldn't even standing around this person you felt there was like some pow something powerful you know but then I go out to dinner with this guy um, myself and this other person and a whole group of celebrities as well he had around with him his security was uh, was a, a heavyweight the heavyweight champion of Russia okay that was his head of security he emptied the restaurant anyway cut a long story short there was nothing like Jesus about him he was angry and uh, uh, rude to the waiters he was a person who expected he was um, like he, he was just so unkind his jokes were rude during dinner and it was just it was just a like you, they say never meet your heroes you know that was one of those moments and I was heartbroken I was heartbroken but yet the traditions, the fruit of like the 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 amazing work the, that he was doing was still happening, but it was empty in his own life. And I can I think this is where Jesus is saying that you can serve God, you can give people the impression that you're holy and that everything is good because of your traditions, because of your um, your time of worship, your you you being a priest, a nun, and doing great things. But hey, are these sins in your life? And if they are, something's not aligning, something's not, not in order. And I think there's something about the fact that Jesus is saying here, and he says it in other places where he says, you know, the things that are in the dark will come out into the light, that in this list that he gives us at the end of the passage, that these things do come out, that these things do emerge. And so what comes from within, if it's what, what's from within that makes us uh, impure before God or unable to stand before God, that, that that'll actually show that actually comes through. And so you know, he, he gives these, you know, there are 12 different things that he names here, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, arrogance, folly. They could all sound really severe and really dramatic. But well, I think what he's also saying here is that these things start in the heart and they don't, they don't start looking like these things. They're just these little, mm -hmm. um, little weeds that just, they blossom, you know, they, they just flourish if they're not checked. Yeah. And, and what you're saying there is so true that we can have the external things looking right, but the the stuff of the heart is what matters, and it'll come out in those unguarded moments, in the way that we treat people when we don't think other people are watching, in the in what we say about people when they're not there. These things it, it comes out, and so Jesus Jesus' words here I think are really challenging. Remember, there's that little Pharisee running around inside all of us, and mm. we can't look at these things and say, "Oh, I don't murder anybody, and I'm not deceitful, or I don't, you know, I haven't committed adultery." But to recognize that, you know, Jesus is speaking to us as a little Pharisee inside of us too. And we need to pay attention and say, 
maybe there's maybe there's some things in my heart here that Jesus wants to actually uproot and replace with you know his love yeah. kindness gentleness patience peace you know his his fruits the fruits of the spirit yes and again this is the the beauty and the the mercy of god in his warning and it's also again our responsibility to be that voice and we'll talk a little bit about that but um quickly I'd like to hear a little message from our sponsors uh, from encounter courses FRG Ministry presents our new online course subscription package. As a member, you will receive digital on-demand access to FRG Ministry's growing library of online courses. FRG Ministry online courses cover teaching, devotional and practical elements of the Catholic faith to help individuals, teachers, students and parishes across the world grow in their faith and understanding of the Catholic Church and their relationship with Jesus Christ. Current titles include Knowing Mary, School of Prayer, Pentecost and the Holy Spirit, Introduction to the Bible and more, with new courses being added regularly. All courses include high-definition videos with expert and engaging speakers, testimonies from everyday Catholics and downloadable content including interactive PDF guides, prayer cards and phone wallpapers. Online courses from FRG Ministry are also accredited for professional development for Catholic education staff in Australia. For more information about enrolment and subscription options, head to courses.frgministry.com forward slash subscription. So now we're going to talk a little bit about a topic, a topic of, of being um, the people who bring about this message of love to the world. Father Chris, this is this is your speciality. This is what you've given your life to. I um I, I think it was um, um Evangelium Nutandi somewhere there. I forgot who wrote that. <laughs> pope a pope of some Paul sort. The Paul the Sixth. He says the, the church exists to evangelize. And and I think Pope Francis, I heard Pope Francis on a on a, an Instagram post who was saying that this is he was reiterating the same thing. He was saying that the church um exists to bring the message of hope to evangelize. Um we are called, each and every one of us are called to be saints, yes, but not in isolation. We are called to bring the sanctity of others about through the way we act, react. One thing that frustrates me, and that's at the core of, um, I think of, of, uh, yeah, it's, it's a, a, a quote attributed, which is a lovely quote, to Saint Francis of Assisi, and it says this: um, "Preach the gospel, and if you have to, use words." But the thing is, we have to. Very often, we have to use words because the thing is, people, we use words through the way we speak, through our actions. Yes but also through our leadership. But anyway, um, I, I want to know your thoughts on evangelization. You run um, a center that is focused on, on evangelizing. Tell us a little bit about this and why you came to open this center. Yeah, great. Well, look, the Arete Center, the word Arete is a Greek word. It means excellence. And so the idea here is that it's about, we want to create a place where we really are seeking excellence in the church for the church's most important task, which is to help people encounter Jesus and to be drawn into communion with God through that encounter with him. I guess for me, it, it really begins in my own experience, my own journey. Um, as a 16-year-old kid, um, go, I, I was, I'd was i gone to Catholic Mass all my life. I'd come from a Catholic family. Um, but I very much, a little bit like what we were talking about earlier, I was doing those things, but my heart was in very different places. And a school teacher reached out to me and started inviting me on retreats and camps and things. And he did that for about a year and until I eventually said yes. And in that, in that, on that camp, um, I was, I, I was open through a mystery in a, of, of God's providence. I was open to really hearing the gospel, really hearing the message that Jesus came to bring as if for the first time, maybe I'd heard it before, but it was like, I'd never really heard it. And Quite simply, what happened was that I experienced the love that God has for me, just a, a glimpse and taste of it. But it was enough that I just went, I want to love you with everything I've got back. And I think evangelization is really about that. It's when mm. we've fallen in love, you want to share that. Like the, the guy who meets the girl, falls in love, he can't he can't be quiet about that. He's got to talk about her. He's got to say, look, I've just entered into the best relationship ever with this beautiful person. And he, he'll tell you all about the woman that he's met and all about her attributes and qualities. Well, if that's true in human relationships, how much more is it so when we encounter God? Yeah, I, I, I encounter, encounter one who loves us like that. 
you know? I, I cannot help but think when you were mentioning that <laughs> um, about when someone has a baby. I don't know if you have on your Instagram feed or something, someone has a baby, you know they have a baby because every single post, they move their hand to the right, there's a photo. They move their hand to the left, there's a photo. They open their eyes, they have a photo. And you're thinking, enough, they're all the same to me. But not to the mom, not to the dad, because they're, they're in love, they're in love and they even though they don't care if you're interested or not to a sense they just want to tell the world and this is again this is a beautiful encounter of love this is where it stems from the 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 love they have absolutely so for me that's evangelization it's really about how do i share the love that i've received with others um, but you have to be clever about it sorry you have to be clever about it you can't really? just blurt out and often I think what happens, and I was certainly guilty of this as a young man, was you just think, oh, all I have to do is just say it and everyone will immediately go, oh, that's amazing. Um, but it, it doesn't always work like that. People sometimes have obstacles and roadblocks in their lives which may, make it hard for them to hear the good news that God loves them. And so one of the things that we perhaps need to get a whole lot better at in the church is recognising, particularly that we're in this new moment in history. This is a new, a new world that we're living in. It's a new moment in our culture. So to understand what's going on in our culture and work out how do we talk mm -hmm. about the person of Jesus in a way that people could hear it. And first and foremost, you know, that I agree with you. I'm frustrated about that quote that's attributed to St. Francis. It's not from him. He never said it. But <laughs> the point that is true in that is about the power of our witness of our lives. But then we've also got to know how to say something about what we believe, about who we love. And to do that in a way that's respectful of others. You know, for so many people, the image of evangelization that they have is, you know, the person coming to the door and beating them over the head with the Bible or the televangelist. For us as Catholics, we do evangelization a little bit differently from that. We do it with a whole lot of respect. We do that with real care for the person that we're talking to because they're made in the image and likeness of God. They're loved by God. And we're not trying to we're not trying to win an argument. We're not trying to Going to kind of tick a box or claim a, you know, like um, sort of, you know, add to our score, if you like. Mm -hmm. What we're trying to do is help people, a real person, the person in front of us, the, the member of our family, the person in our parish, the people that we work with or go to school or university with. We're trying to very respectfully and gently help them encounter the person of Jesus. And so the Arete Center really helps you. What we've designed there in the course is to help people discover the tools so firstly the, the the theoretical or theological foundation but also the very practical skills about how you go about this how we can do it in such a way where um, god has room to move that people aren't turned off by our approach but they actually are intrigued by what we have to say and what we have to share and so i think this is a, again comes to the point of being equipped it's a, like we have even myself as a teenager, you know, I experienced the love of God and I remember being in, in year 12 and just going, telling people about Jesus and they thought I was nuts, they thought I was crazy, they labelled me. Now, I had no intention then of being a priest, but they used to call me the priest. And uh, like, they're saying, it, it, I, the intention was right, but I wasn't equipped. Later, I learned to use sort of social media, I learned to use music, I learned, I became intentional about it and I worked on the craft. But it's not, all, I also had to work on my leadership, on how I communicate things and how I live authentically as well as a Catholic, as a Christian. So tell me, how do you, in practice, how does the Arete Center work? Do people, what, what happens? So our, our key uh, course is a course called the Foundations of Missionary Leadership. And as you say, what it's for is to say, well, we want to give you the practical skills to be able to evangelize, but we also want you to be able to do that in such a way that you're leading others to be able to do it too. So it's not just that you're equipped, but you in turn equip others. And so our course has four components. Uh, one is around the spirituality of being a missionary leader, which is really about mm. um, that deepening in that encounter with the love of God for ourselves. And that happens through a couple of intensives. And so we, we become a little short-term intentional community through these gatherings. It's a beautiful, rich experience. You pray together, have meals together and learn together as well. Lots of fun. We have a great time. So this is actually, just to clarify, that this is in person. This is not an online yeah. course. So, so people those, can... So those, so those intensives are in person. and then um, But then we also have two semester online courses. Uh, or units as part of the course. One of them is about the theology of mission, and it really helps us understand what evangelization is 
and how we go about particularly evangelizing conversations. We're not we're not all amazing musicians like yourself, and we're also not all social media experts. And so a big part of what we try and do is just simply about the art of conversation because conversations are so crucial. So that those little hidden chats we mm. have with people about uh, our faith and about what it means to follow follow Christ. So we do that in the first semester, and that's online. Wednesday nights we, um, we help online. And then in second semester, we look at leadership in much more detail. Um, we really know that parishes need renewing at this time. We need we know that if we're going to be if we're going to be everything the church calls us to be, everything God wants the church to be, we need people who are equipped to lead, especially lay people to work well with priests and others, so that we can actually see renewal of parishes, so that they become really vital communities of faith that reach out to others with the love of God. So it's intention. So the idea is also to work within. You're trained to work within the. Catholic environment. So within a parish environment, you're, you're trained also. And I loved how you you said learn to work with priests because priests are really difficult to work with. Well, parish we priests. Need to be able to, we need to be able to help our poor priests. You know, sometimes <laughs> yeah, they, yeah. these are often good guys who are doing it tough, and they need to feel like they've got people who are walking with them and who are really going to help them in the area that they need help maybe the most. Which yes, yeah, the, the most pressing need in our church today is evangelization and leadership. Mm. And so if we can help priests by being leaders in our parishes and also by um, helping our parish to be a more evangelizing place, then we're actually providing an amazing service um, to God first and foremost, but we're, we're really, we're going to be a, an asset to the priest in our parish as well. So, so you, you start with the encounter, people encountering the love of God, making sure we have that, because without that, we have nothing. And then once you have that, you have to like this pearl of great prize. Okay, now how am I going to market it? How am I going to promote it? How am I going to share it with others? And this is where you study your leadership. This is where you study skills. It's also knowledge, knowledge based, because I think you need to know uh, your theology. You need to know also what the teachings of the church and you emphasize things like this. And then from this point, then what? So then the final piece is that in the fourth unit is that we really want to help people reflect upon how they're actually engaging and doing that on the ground where they are. So we're not going to pull you out of wherever you are. What we want you to be is equipped to serve in the place that God's got you. And so what we offer is mentoring every month where people can talk about what they're learning, but how they're trying to implement and act upon what they're learning. So we've really tried to get a real balance between the, the head and mm -hmm. the heart and the hands that all yes. three things you know, are working together. So there's that spiritual formation there's growth as a human being, that human development that's really important here. Sometimes we can be really great at doing ministry, but we haven't focused enough on that human growth and development as well. And so there's a part of that, especially in leadership, that's really important that we focus upon. And then there's that intellectual formation for mission, but it's also about practice, about action. So we're trying to get a real balance, bring all those, those dimensions together so that when people come out of this year-long course, they've really been blessed with the intellectual formation, the head knowledge, but also the heart and the action. They're able yes. to put it into practice in their in their communities back where they are. And so it's so important as well to um, this emphasis on lay leadership because the idea we have very often is that the leaders within the church are the priests. And it's that's so far from the truth. You know, lay people need to speak. They need to be equipped. But what if someone is doesn't want to speak on a microphone? Is this relevant for them? Or maybe they don't want to lead a group. Is this um, something that they can still um, get, gain from? Yeah, absolutely. I would say that the course is really wonderful for people who are in roles. So, the, so youth ministers that are listening to the podcast, to so people who are involved in adult evangelization, maybe you're the alpha coordinator in your parish, um, to people who are on parish councils because you're leaders, I think it's really helpful if you're in those kinds of roles. But we've had a number of people do the course now who um, don't, they can't point to, you know, I'm doing this role or that role, but they say, look, I'm so much more equipped now to be able to share my faith in my ordinary daily life. I don't ever want to get up front and talk, um, but I'm going to find the place where I'm called to serve, where I, I rec and part of what happens through the course is people start to realize the gifts that the Holy Spirit's given them and they find the place where they serve. It's not unusual for someone to say, well, I started off the course doing this, but I found where I really want to serve and they, mm. they get involved in a new area or a different aspect of the church's life and mission. So I think there's something here that if you, if you want to, you don't, you know, leadership doesn't mean you have to be up front. 
you mm-hmm. can lead um, really powerfully without ever being the upfront person. Uh, I'm thinking at the at the moment of just one of the members of my leadership team at St Declan's in Penshurst. Um, she would never be the person who's up front, but she provides an amazing. Uh, she brings so much creativity and energy to our leadership group. She helps us come up with amazing ideas. She's absolutely being a leader for mission by doing that. And so that could be you too, if you're listening to that. Yes, absolutely. And this is the thing as well. Like in, when I start to think of, of lockdown, you know, we're isolated and we're, uh, we're at home. Also, th- that none of that would be wasted. Actually, this is so much of the things that, uh, where I work. It's how, we can, how can we be leaders online? How can we be leaders also in building community when we're isolated? But also family, family. I think this is one of the first place that we need to evangelize, the first place we need to be leaders, first place we need to form and reform uh, our family to become the saints that we're called to be. So this is, uh, I imagine, it's not only about um, taking on a particular role, but it's also building the, the ethos, the conditioning ourselves to becoming leaders as Christ was a leader in his community, with his people, with his disciples, with his family. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Like I, I think a key part of how we understand leadership is that it's after the servant heart of Jesus, you know, that the leadership of Jesus is a leadership of service. And wherever we are in the church, whatever we're called to, we're called to emulate Jesus in that way, to imitate him. The other thing that you reminded me of as you were talking there, Rob, was um, a couple of um, of the members of the leadership team who've done the Arete course when we were in lockdown last year. They, um, they, they rebuilt our website. Our website was old and a bit tired. Um, mm-hmm. They rebuilt our website. There were three three women, two of whom have done the course or doing the course. They rebuilt the website in seven weeks wow. over WhatsApp and Zoom. And Goodness. if you if you go to the, our parish's website, I, I, and I, I take no credit for it, I had nothing to do with it, but this group of women just were able to make an amazing website. Um because, um, and part of that is, you know, they're exercising their leadership, you know, that leadership, they're, they're exactly into that digital place, same oh. with our social media. So I th- I'm I impressed. Say, you know, oh, I just, I was going to say, I just would say like if, um, you know, parishes, I think we know that we need to evangelize and par- we know that parishes need to be revitalized. Um, this course, you know, part of my passion for it was to say, look, there are going to be places that need, they know the need but they don't know how to go about it. Exactly. And that's what, we, that's what we're trying to meet is, well, let, let us help you sh- go, n- learn a little bit more about how to go about it so that our parishes can be places where people come in and they're just blown away by the life and vit- vitality of people who are being transformed by Christ. And if they want to get in touch, what do they do? How do they find out more? Yeah, so the simplest way is to go to our website, uh, aretecenter.org. Arete is spelled A-R-E-T-E. And center, so spell center because we have some American uh, listeners. Okay, so center is C E N T R E. So aretecenter.org. Um, our Instagram is arete, R E A R E T E underscore center, C E N T R E as well. Um, and one of the things I'd just say about this too, Rob, is you can do the course from anywhere. Um, oh, good. Uh, because you can be online so long as you can join us for the intensives. Um, the intensives are face to face. We think that's so important. But the online piece means that you, yeah, you know, we've got people doing the course at the moment who are in Melbourne. We've got people who did the course last year who were in Adelaide. People in country New South Wales um, who've been able to do the course with us. So it really is open to people uh, across the country. And that's beautiful. And again, this is a, uh, such a great opportunity for because many times we want to to know more. We want to grow. And this is what we do at FRG Ministries that we we're trying to fulfill a, a need um, to people to to get to know Jesus, to get to love Jesus. But at the same time, there's a certain level to which we reach, and then we hand over to programs like this, where if you really want to grow in depth. And, and in leadership, these are the places to connect with. And we'll have great opportunities also to talk about different opportunities, but this is uh, uh, something I highly, so highly recommend. So just go to um, aretecenter.org. Org. Uh, and just dot org. Okay, so aretecenter.org or arete underscore center. And there you can get all the information you need. Um, so this is great. So we're just going to hear a little word from our ministry partners. The production of this podcast would not be possible without the support of our donors and ministry partners. 
If you've been blessed by this podcast, please consider supporting this ministry financially by making a one-off donation or becoming an FRG ministry partner from just $5 per month, as well as enabling FRG ministry to impact hearts across the world through the creation of online resources and outreach programs. As an FRG ministry partner, you will have access to our rewards program, where you can receive exclusive benefits and content to help you continue to grow in your relationship with Jesus. For more information about becoming an FRG ministry partner, head to frgministry.com slash donate. We're so grateful for our ministry partners without whom this program, this um, would this podcast would not be possible. So again, if you're interested in becoming a ministry partner or supporting this, this non-for-profit charity, please go to frgministry.com forward slash donate or frgministry.com forward slash ministry partner. Father Chris, I cannot thank you enough. You were nervous about this podcast <laughs> because the gospel was difficult, but I, I think we sailed through pretty well. <laughs> it was a tough passage, but um, hopefully it's been helpful for people and it's encouraged them in some way. So this is great. Thank you. Thank you once again for joining us. Um, please be in touch um, at FRG Ministry on social media um, or at Catholic uh, underscore um, Catholic influencers underscore. Um, also, leave us a review on on um, Apple, iTunes, anywhere. This brings us up on the algorithm as well. Again, thank you to our ministry partners and also to Arete. Again, go to Arete <laughs> Center C E N dot org. Arete Center dot org. Thank you once again. God bless you, and you'll hear from us again next week. <laughs>